Blog Talk Radio. This is a girl, George, and the Dragons Radio Show. Today we have somebody that's very pivotal in in the progression of the whole thing of rock and roll. She was one of the first VJs on MTV. So this was the best. She was the best one, too. (laughs) This is Nina Blackwood. Hi, Nina. Hello, girl, George. Boy, that was some way to start the show. I like that. (laughs) Oh, that was my song. That was one of my songs. I know. I'm I'm sort of a punk rocker. What? I'm a punk rocker. I play an L bar down in L.A. I was listening to that, and uh, it sounds like Courtney Love might have stolen some of your stuff. Could be. I wrote this years ago, years and years. Yeah, ago, back yeah, in, but it's in very. 83. Um, yeah, uh, I, I could hear her doing, uh, or I could hear your stuff in her. I should say. I've got thousands. Of, I well, there you go. That's a good week. attitude. That's a good attitude. And I still attitude. do. I still write songs every week. I might write one about you this week. I, I write about whatever happened that week. So, you know, lately I've been writing whoever was on my show, I write a song. About. Yeah, it turns into a song. <laughs> You're kind of like a punk Taylor Swift then. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll try and be nice so it's a nice song and not, not a bad one. <laughs> Well, I, I, I love MTV. See, when we went to Nashville, me and Star went to Nashville back in 71. And, mm-hmm. and we, we told everybody we were going to be superstars, big as Beatles. And we went to see Shel- Shelby Singleton that owned Sun Records. And sure. after he seen us, after he seen us play, he says, well, I don't know what to tell you because you guys are so visual. Video is the next thing that's going to be out. This is 1971. And he, wow. he thought that video discs were going to be the next thing that would replace records with video discs where you uh-huh, saw the yeah, band yeah. play. And there was these uh-huh. big records that you put on. That's what he thought was going to happen. He says, when that happens, you're going to be the biggest thing. Oh, I wore a sword. I wore a sword and a cape and pirate boots. And, and, and my partner was half naked, looked like a Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. So we were very vigil. And he says, well, when Mm -hmm. video comes out, you're going to be the biggest thing going. So when MTV came about, me and Star were already broken up by then. And and that's when you came on. I go, wow. That's when I went to L.A. and that's when I ended up in Alice Bar, which is the underground again. I belong in the underground. I'm too too raw for (laughs) prime time. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with that because I, I, I think these days... Uh, there's so uh, it, it, well, I, I shouldn't say these days in pop music. There's a lot of homogenization uh, with the music, so I, I always prefer left of center. Yeah, me too. I I, yeah. I fit best in in Al's Bar in L.A. or, or uh, at the Central in Hollywood. I used to play there, and and the Mabuhai in San Francisco, and. The Red Dog Saloon in Nashville. I don't really belong in the in the pop or you know the yeah. mainstream. I, I have more fun screaming and yelling at the audience. I still do it. I'm 70 years old. I still yeah. play every Wednesday in an underground club in Berkeley, and I still scream and yell and write new songs every week. <laughs> That's great. I mean, you can't ask for more, really. Yeah, You're yeah happy. I'm still doing it. I'm still yeah. doing it. Some people aren't. Some people didn't make it as long as me either. <laughs> yeah, some people give up. So I think it's great. You're still you're still following your muse. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Um, well, I do radio. I'm on uh Sirius XM seven days a week. And uh also I have a couple of um, syndicated radio shows through United Stations, uh, United Stations Radio Network, so uh, absolutely 80s New Wave Nation. And uh, the four of us, uh, the four surviving uh, original MTV VJs, Mark Goodman, Martha Quinn, Alan Hunter, and myself, uh, wrote a book along with Gavin Edwards. He was the guy who compiled it, did a great job. Uh, so our book came out last year. It's called VJ, The Unplugged Adventures of MTV's First Wave. So that was pretty cool. That was that was kind of uh, uh, 
uh, fun to work on. Well, they should make a movie about you guys. They should make a well, movie about yeah, the beginning of you know MTV and you guys and all that shit. Well, you know, there are things that that uh, you know come up every now and then that are in the works, and but Hollywood, you know how that is, it takes forever yeah. for anything to get done, and you know, and, and until it's actually going, well, I believe it. But uh, yeah, it would make a great, great movie, or uh, you know, a little maybe even a, a a a TV show, a series. Yeah, 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 yeah. They made a movie about. Uh, me and Star in Nashville, George and Arizona Star in Nashville. Really? Back in seventy no. one, yeah. Well, what it was is Guy Clark. You know Guy Clark, the songwriter. Yeah. He wrote a sure. song about us, and uh, the the girl that does the newscast in Nashville heard the song, and she makes documentaries on the side. That's her 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 sideline thing. Uh-huh. And she heard the song as she looked us up and they asked everybody about us and they said, Oh yeah, we know George is sorry. George used to pull out her swords and and fight everybody. I wish I didn't. I wore a sword but I never pulled that. But anyway, everyone had stories about us. So they found me they came all the way from Nashville to Berkeley and filmed me. They found Star in London and filmed her in London and Chris Christopherson's in the movie and everything. So they made mm. a two hour movie about us. So that was cool. And now Al's Bar in, in L.A. is making a movie. They found me about a month or two ago and came up from L.A. and filmed me for that. And so that's about L.A., Al's Bar, you know, in the 80s and mm-hmm. 90s. So I, I wanted to know, how, how do you know <laughs> our mutual uh, acquaintance, my manager who also manages uh, David Allen Coe? Well, see, David Allen Cole was one of our friends in Nashville. We went to Nashville in 1970. Chris Christopher, well, we met Chris Christopher in San Francisco, and he saw us, and he said, oh, you guys should go to Nashville. You guys are just so funny. You, they'll love you. Uh-huh. So we went to Nashville. I, I wrote Shelby Singleton a letter and told him that we were great. Uh, and he says, well, if you can be here in three days, well, I'll see you. So I told Star, we got to go to Nashville. So Star wrote a bum chat, and we we, we flew oh, to Nashville. No. Me, me and her and her piano play our piano. Well, she got her day to pay for it later, but we got there on a bum check. And so we went there with no money, and we hitchhiked around. And Farron Young picked us up hitchhiking, and he gave us twenty dollars. Here, here, kids, uh, and we went to the Ramada Inn because we heard that's where Johnny Cash was filming his his TV show. And so we uh-huh. went to the Ramada Inn and went to the restaurant in there. And we were sitting there, and Star was drawing a picture, you know, which was going to be our album cover. And, and, and Shel Silverstein came over to us and said, what are you drawing? I said, well, this is our album cover here. And he held it up to his ear, and he said, I don't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, That's funny. We, we went to see, uh, 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 we went to see what's-his-face, uh, Shelby Singleton, the next day. And, and, and once he's seen us play, he says, well, I don't know what to tell you, you know. If video ain't here yet. You know, you're a little ahead of your time. Uh, so so you are the beginning of where we should have been. We were just like 10 years early. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what can you do? Oh, well. And, and actually, country country was late well, I with never the was country. Coming. We weren't country. We were, we were rock and roll back then. So when punk uh-huh. came, it was perfect for me because I was always rock and roll. I'm from San Francisco. I'm not country. Uh-huh. We just went there because Chris told us we should go there. And we saw, well, Dylan records there and, and George right, Harrison right. records there. So why not? And we signed with well, Pete there... Drake right off, which which played with uh, George Harrison. So, oh, but Pete Drake they... was phenomenal. Yeah, but they still tried to turn us into country. And then Shel Silverstein, he hated me for years, for a couple of years, because cause he thought it was a, because uh, we told him we were going to be bigger than the Beatles. And, and he thought we were obnoxious bitches, you know, especially me. You know, I wore a sword and stuff. And, and then two years later, Vince Matthews drug him into the, to the Red Dog Saloon to see us play and he grabbed me. And he says, I apologize for everything I ever thought of you. He says, and you know what that is. And, but I haven't been so impressed by an act since I've seen Elvis the first time. He says, you shouldn't be with Pete, Pete's Two Country. You should be with my producer, which handles Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show. So he got his producer, 
uh, Ron Haskin that did Dr. Hook, which was back in San Francisco, to sign us up. So he broke contract with P and went back to San Francisco and went on the road with Dr. Hook. And then Star mm. married our guitar player from Nashville and quit, and that was into that. Oh, boy. <laughs> but we went on tour with Dr. Hook. That was fun. Playing with Chuck Berry, Stevie Wonder, and big, big, big concerts. Wow. So that's when you met David. Down, when you were oh, down I met David before when we were in Nashville. When we were in Nashville, we knew Chris Gustafson, David Allen Coe, and Billy Swan, and and the Raging Cajun, uh, Doug Kershaw, and oh Eddie God, Rabbit, Doug Kershaw, and, yeah, and Billy Joe Shaver. Those were all, all the those guys we hung out with. Yeah, because well, that was kind of the crazy, new wave. And they were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That was the and new wave came in, of we were country. And with Chris Gustafson. So that got us right in the crowd right off because he was our buddy and he told everybody he was our buddy. He used to come and see us at the Red Dog Saloon. He's so a that cool guy. Was right in the middle. Oh, he's great. Chris is great. Yeah. Do you know Chris? Yes. Yeah, I oh, interviewed was... him and also we did uh, a very funny thing. <laughs> um, do you remember the Dick Clark? They ha- uh, he used to have the show. Um, uh, where he the bloopers, I think it was bloopers, and he would um, yeah 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 that thing and well uh, Willie Nelson and myself uh, Dick uh, Dick used to hire me for a bunch of stuff and uh, they were filming some uh, movie I don't remember what it was but it was down in Texas Willie and Chris and so uh, Dick brought me in as you know a, a full interviewer to interview. Uh, I did interview, but, I mean, this was all part of the, uh, uh, you know, the show. And we had Chris come in, and we're doing this regular interview and having these, like, phony call-ins. <laughs> yeah. And the call-in, uh, one of them was a woman supposedly going into labor. So, <laughs> and to see how Chris reacted, and, and Willie was in on it. So it was quite funny, and and, uh, and I've done interviews with him. You know, I'm not a pal of his like you are, but uh, I do know him, and uh, I like him. Oh, boy, was he, he – he wasn't, like, really, like, for real mad, but, boy, when he found out that it was a joke, <laughs> those eyes, you know, he's got those intense blue eyes, he just yeah. looked at us, and then he burst out laughing. Oh, Chris is great. I love him. Yeah, I mean, he's so a good generous. guy. He, he 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 like if he likes somebody, he promotes them. You know, like when he seen us play, he thought we were great. So he told everybody we were great and drug us around to all these clubs in Berkeley where where the Iron Butterfly was playing and and had them put us on the stage and we'd break all our strings because we were fuck ups, you know. And they go, what the fuck is this? He's oh, you guys did the greatest thing there ever was. This is gonna be the biggest thing going. But you know, we'd fuck up every time, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, San Francisco, I haven't been there for a long time, but uh, it was kind of like an adopted city for a while for me when I lived in L.A. I was always up there hosting the Bammies and doing all wow. sorts of different things. And I found <clears throat> I found at the time, and we're talking like late 80s, early 90s when I was going up there, uh, that the San Francisco music community was very supportive of each other. I don't know if it's still the case. But uh, certainly was then, and of course in the 60s, you were there for that. Um, you know, I wasn't. I wanted to be there for that. I was going to drive my Volkswagen <laughs> across country. <laughs> I used to have dreams of being in the Jefferson Airplane house, you know, so I was there in my mind. But, yeah. uh, you know, is it still like that there? Uh, or yes, is it kind of because of Sam Silicon Valley kind of... What? It's always been an art community, San Francisco, yeah. Berkeley. It's all artists and dreamers, you know. Yeah. But Nashville was like that. Nashville, everybody was really, you know, they'd sleep on each other's floors and they'd write together yeah. and they'd play together. Nashville was more that way than any place I've ever seen at the time, yeah. 1971 to 73. <clears throat> I mean, it was like everyone was brothers. Everyone was, you know. They, we we all were family, you know. You need to write a book. Well, there's been two movies about me. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet your book would be very interesting with all the different people that you've run into in your experiences. 
Oh, I've I've known such great people. I've known Lyle Tuttle, the tattoo artist. I've known him since I was sixteen. Now I was there when he 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 started tattooing Janice, and, and, and I was there when he tattooed the Elmer Brothers when those they got those armbands. I had just mm-hmm. come back from Nashville, and I ran into him again, and I was there on acid because <laughs> they were all on acid at the time. <laughs> <coughs> So since you were actually part of the hate Ashbury thing, was it was it as cool as it seemed oh, to be? Oh, it was from, great. Yeah, it was great. It was it, it was everybody was so friendly. I was friends with Charlottesons, which were the ones that started the whole thing, and I was playing up in North Beach, up on on Grant Avenue before it started. That's where Janice first started playing. That's where the Bohemian thing was before the hippie thing. So mm-hmm. I came in like right at the tail end of of the bohemian thing when it was just turned into folk music then and uh i started playing at the coffee gallery like about 1965 you know and then the hippie thing came later and i met all the people that i knew in the hashberry from the coffee gallery because they all hung out there all the Mm -hmm. the heads the older heads the ones that actually started not the little kids that hitchhiked in and and did Mm -hmm. and slept on floors and were 16 but the ones that were actually movers and shakers, the artists, mm-hmm. the musicians and stuff, they all came down to the coffee gallery. So it must have been. So that's a, where a, I started a, playing. Was at the coffee gallery. <clears throat> Excuse me. Must have been a, a fantastic time though for you. It was great. A lot of acid, but people were very friendly. <laughs> well, hey, you know. <laughs> It, 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 that, it doesn't hurt, you know, unless you have a bad trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of all, what it was all about. Peace, if love, don't kill understanding. You, it stronger, is that how they say it? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did how did how did you end up on on MTV? How did that happen? Um, well, it's kind of long long story, so I'll just be you know kind of brief about it. Uh, you know, I always played music since I was a little kid, so I always had that, and I was always performing, like what we were talking about before the show. Um, you know, since since like four years old with piano, and then with acting and performing on stage, eight. So I was already doing that my whole life. Cut to the chase. I was out in L.A. Um, Danny, who was my manager back then, uh, knew this guy named Michael Seenhart. Now, this is back in 78, um, and he was really on the cutting edge of video. Uh, you know, he had all this equipment and all, all this stuff. He would go around to clubs and uh, show videos, which at that time were basically uh, European and and British because the, the people weren't making them here. But uh, videos were initially started from the record companies as uh, like inner off not inner office but inner business uh, promotional tools. So um, he and I did this uh, kind of underground. Uh, I guess you could call it a pilot K punk that I was. Uh, you know, functioning as a host, we'd go down to uh, uh, Chinatown, which at that time uh, was all punks, you know, and do man on the street stuff. And then we'd do these weirdo interview things and had the videos. And then I also worked with two other uh, people that were kind of starting to get into the video music thing as hosts as well. So I was already kind of dabbling in that area. And uh, I always read Billboard magazine, and I saw a little article, uh, not an ad, but an article saying that this 24-hour music channel was looking for hosts and hostesses that you know must know music and, and the music business. And I go, ah, that's, that sounds like what I'm doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, basically, send in the resume, the uh, 8x10. They came out a couple of different times uh, to do an interview, and then they decided... Um, I guess it was June. Oh, they flew me to New York also and kind of wined and dined me because I didn't know it was going to be in New York. I thought satellite radio, I mean satellite television, I could still be in L.A. So I was a little taken back. Oh, my God, I have to move to New York. But um, so uh, it turned out they hired me. I was the first one they first on air person that they hired. So what date did it start? 
Uh, August 1st, 1981. Yeah, that was the launch. And that was uh, uh, an an amazing experience. So it was. How long did you do it? How long did you do it there? I was there for five years, and then I uh, moved back to L.A. because I had a bunch of job offers. I was doing Entertainment Tonight, and uh, I don't know if you remember Solid Gold, and yeah, yeah. Uh, also a, a radio program uh, through the same syndicator that I'm with now, <laughs> way back then. <laughs> so, um, And I, I know Ted Turner's company asked me. There, I, I did a, a pilot for the American version of Top of the Pop, so there were a lot of things um, that were being offered to me, and at that time, about five years in, MTV was kind of leveling off. And instead of getting more things to do, we were getting less things to do. So, you know, the the combination of having these offers and also seeing that there was no upward mobility at MTV, I decided, well... You know, it's it's much much to the pleasure of my my uh, manager and my agent who had been trying to get me out of there for like two years, and I kept going, no, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, because it was like a family. Finally, yeah. said, you know, this is this is the time, and uh, um, you know, and I had had a great time. Do it was like graduating, basically. It was, you know, going from MTV and then, um, you know, going to broadcast television. So it was kind of cool. Well, well, you got to keep moving in show business. You can't stay in one place very long. You got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was, it was. I, I, I think it was very much the right time uh, to go because then they started getting some uh, uh, programming that was not music related, like remote control and the reality crapola you know and uh so it was yeah, the right pregnant time to leave. at 16 oh, oh yeah, that whoopee. was much later but they started <laughs> they started getting into right after i left started getting into the non-music programming which is really a shame um yeah. you know i i wish that they had kept uh you know it, it, it obviously would have had to uh change from what it was in the beginning you can't have videos 24 hours a day nowadays but at least keep the root music and they didn't at all you know which which i think that's too bad yeah so so we can find you on on, uh, facebook anytime right Uh. oh yeah all that social stuff uh, Danny actually takes care of the business one, and I have a Facebook page that's that's my other passion, which is nature and animals. So uh-huh. there's one that's very personal about the the environment, and then there's the other one that's uh, you know about the music and what I'm doing, and uh, you know the radio stuff and everything. And I so love, they can I, find I, out I, what you're doing at any time by just going plugging in your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the website ninablackwood.net. So, uh, or if they want to go on any, uh, you know, the Sirius uh, site, Sirius XM, uh, uh, Big Eighties on Eight, they can also go over there. Does it stay there so you can listen to it another time, or isn't when it isn't live? Uh, I'm sorry. What was the question? Can you hear it at another time? Does it stay in the place? Or do you have to hear it live? Do you have to hear the? Oh, uh, you mean serious? Um, yeah. Yeah, not through the not through the uh, their site, but there's a way. I I don't know the technology behind it, but there's a way that you can get um, the, the channels online as well as uh, you know in your car or wherever. But I I don't know the details. If they go to SiriusXM uh, dot com, it'll tell you how you can do that. Because this show here stays on this blog radio station forever, the audio of it. And then I take the audio of it and take pictures of you and add that to it and put it up on YouTube so you can see what you look like while we're talking. So that stays up on YouTube forever. It It's there until, until the web goes down or changes into something else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Eternity. It was great talking to you, Nina. I've always wanted to meet you. Sometime when you're in Berkeley, you come on down and see me. 
Yeah, boy, it's been a while since I've been in San Francisco, and I like I was saying earlier, I just love that city. Uh, I'm sad though about what's happening, uh, you know, which is very similar to what's happening in New York. You know, uh, people are being outpriced; they can't afford to live there anymore. Well, that's, is, that's showbiz. We got to go now, so see you later, all right. alligator. Bye. Thank you very much, and good luck, and keep on rocking over there. Yeah, keep on trucking. Okay, thank you. Everybody's crazy but me. Everybody nutty as can be. Farming game, waging war, paint the names upon the door. You against me, us versus them. No communicado, don't give a damn. Our kids in the street are the gross casualty now. Everybody's crazy but me. Everybody's nutty as can be. Raising the oceans with dairy for oil. Loving for money, divvy and foil. Build bigger bombs, store them all up. More and more bombs, they won't take our stuff. Push the wrong button, we're all history now.